Ronan Williams is back for a third year to kick off the year with key trends to look out for in 2023 and how these trends will impact cities, businesses and citizens. We'll talk about green lining, Georgism, livable cities, the future of technology and cities and much more. Bronwyn, welcome. It's always great to have you on the show. Let's kick off with the first trend, and that's called green redlining or green lining. What is it and how do you see it impacting us in 2023? Okay, so it's no secret that, of course, the climate crisis is at the forefront of all sorts of conversations that everybody's having at all levels of society at the moment. And of course, in exchange for that, we're having to create more sustainable policies when it comes to what we build, where we build, how we live, how we work with each other to try and reduce our carbon footprints. But now, of course, any sort of good intention, given that we are human beings and we do respond to incentives, can also inadvertently incentivize some less than benevolent behavior. Hence the emergence of this trend that we're terming green redlining or green lining. Now, redlining is the practice whereby somewhat nefarious banks and businesses would discriminate nominally not on racial or demographic lines, but rather using a proxy for racial or demographic lines in terms of, say, postal or zip codes in order to have price discrimination between certain groups. And this is, of course, a practice that has been condemned widely in society, and some of our local banks in South Africa have been caught out doing this. Now, this is green redlining, which is slightly different, and this is using environmental concerns as a proxy for discrimination, again, against socioeconomic or demographic groups from living close to more privileged, more entrenched groups in society. So green lighting in a city planning sense can kind of be seen as new age nimbyism or not in my backyardism. So instead of saying, I don't want you to build a low cost housing development near my estate, my nice residential estate in the northern suburbs, because it's going to depreciate my property values and because I don't want poor people living next to me. Instead of saying this, which is obviously not socially acceptable at all, a green liner would say, oh, we don't want this low cost housing development built next to our pristine golf estate in Santon because it's going to disrupt the local flora and fauna and have a negative carbon footprint. So it's using green concerns as an excuse to perpetuate discrimination along spatial lines. So it's a continuation of some of the other trends we've spoken about on this show, things like ha-ha cities or these invisible borders between communities. So green lining or green red lining is definitely something to watch out for. The second key trend is around the reappearance of an ideology called Georgism new ideas around how we value things. How do you see this playing out? Because I do tend to look at the future of money and economics quite a lot, I'm quite interested in new ideas that are being framed around how we value properties and cities and all the rest of it. And one of these new old ideas that's getting, it's coming around once again, getting airtime at the moment, is the idea of Georgism. So Georgism is the idea that all wealth in society comes from land. And this, of course, is something that's very close to political hotspots and sore touch points in South African political history. The land question has always been a big issue in our societies. And of course, we know this. We know that land gets value because of what's around it and because of natural endowments, not just because of what we build on top of it. And there is, of course, resentment when it comes to things like inequality, that landowners or renter land or rentier kind of landlords could be exploiting the more landless classes. And of course, land ownership is a very important thing. So anyway, the Georgist idea is that we actually tax land from landowners at a much higher rate rather than taxing things like income or capital gains or anything else, because the inference is that the value of all those other things actually comes from who has control over those natural resource endowments that are actually endowments for the entire common good. In other words, instead of saying we have to expropriate all the land and put it in the, the hands of the state, which is, of course, the more socialist way to deal with this sort of problem, or instead of allowing the land-owning class to extract as much capitalist sort of rents and seek rents in those spaces, which is, of course, the capitalist way of sort of solving the land rights and property rights question, Neither of those views are particularly satisfying for people. The Georgia solution says instead, private people can own natural endowments and lands. And because of that, of course, incentivizes people to build things like housing, which are all good for society. 
But instead, those landowners shouldn't be able to hold on to all the value of that land. Instead, in fact, the entire basically rent-seeking portion of rents that come that, that property owners are able to sort of pass on to their tenants and to society at large should be taxed. So the entire society can actually benefit from that natural resource endowment. And for examples that are sort of more global scale, Norway's done this quite successfully with their natural oil endowments in that they heavily tax capitalist entities who are allowed to extract the oil and sell it, but the vast majority of their profits go back to the people who actually should be the natural recipients of the endowments of that land, which is a very interesting concept to look, talk about, particularly in the South African context, when it comes to land rights, property rights, and how we fund societal development going forward. I do like the sound of a policy that will allow a mere mortal like myself to pay less tax. Well, yes, it's a perfect wealth tax, right? Because like, you know, we talk about wealth taxes, taxing things like inheritance, but that doesn't actually solve wealth problems because wealthy people can simply move. People are, are movable, right? <laughs> you know, so you've still got wealthy people that can still live there and even own your property as we have in South Africa, right? We've got very wealthy foreigners that own our land and that value, any value that accrues on that land is generally due to developments around or discovery of new natural resources, that value is then extracted or exported to those foreigners' personal hands, rather than continuing to support future generations of the local population. This is a way to attack wealth at its core, and it's a hugely progressive tax. We're taxing then essentially monopoly rights or private recipients of public sort of for support, which is what comes from having like law and order and property rights and all of those sorts of things. There's a much fairer way of distributing our natural bounty. And it's a way that really, it, it talks to compromise across various different political lines. So I think people in both like the EFF and the DA could see the sense in this sort of a policy at dealing with healing some of those past historic wounds in a progressive and very fast track way, actually. Do you see anything on this happening at the moment? Are there political parties talking about it? And how long do you think before we see some kind of impact? Well, the wheels of policy turn very, very slowly, but it's an opportunity that if politicians here locally start to actually put this onto their election mandates, we've got election cycles coming up, there's no reason that you can't even start to do this at the city level, right? So municipal taxes sort of shifting that more towards property taxes and less towards rates and services and all the rest of it. Those are things that we can start to do at a city level so that we can use more of our or collect more of the budget that we need in order to fulfill the services, the, the physical and physical security services that a government is supposed to uh, provide for their citizens through things like a property land tax that better equally, equitably so sort of distributes the actual bounty and value of that community and of that city among its residents, we can start to see this happening at, at sort of the local level. And then hopefully these policies become more integrated into party manifestos going forward. But anyway, as I mentioned, the Norway test case is quite robust. It's been going for quite some years. And these sorts of ideas can be applied to other scarce resources where we see monopoly rent seekers sort of squatting on scarce resources and passing those costs on to us. Things like spectrum, things like mining rights, things like land, of course, and even the electricity question could all benefit from this sort of thinking. So anyway, I just use whatever platform that I have to sort of uh, see these ideas into interesting places and put them into different people's hands because different people from city planners all the way through to politicians can actually start to adopt some of these these compromise ideas, but positive compromise rather than sort of lose-lose compromise ideas that we haven't tested for quite some time. The third key trend is around a much spoken about topic and that's called livable cities. How do we extend the conversation of livable cities and what new trends and focus areas should we look out for? Okay, so from a macro sort of city planning perspective, we're seeing the conversation shift away from efficiency, in other words, getting that workforce to the CBD as quickly as possible, building bigger and bigger highways, you know, extending those grid blocks, because it's all about efficiency and moving people around from point A to point B, rather into talking about making more livable cities. Again, in this show, I think I've spoken in the past about things like 15-minute cities, this idea of being able to sort of have everything you need in your life on your day-to-day -day basis, from education to food, entertainment, a place to work, place to live, all within sort of walking distance. 
this is kind of an extension of that conversation. It draws from everything from in terms of quality of life that people are looking for, those shifts in how many people are now remote working rather than working in an office, and even questions around the, the climate crisis once again. And it's about how we build our cities. In other words, the sort of grid layout of cities is losing favor as it should. It's hugely inhumane. If you've ever walked through a very big city like Johannesburg or New York on a cold, windy winter's day, you are kind of blasted with those corridors between those giant buildings. It's not pleasant to walk on those sorts of streets. It's quite exposed. If you're familiar with Jane Jacobs' work, it's not very good for crime and security either. Really, the sort of cities that are more human and more nice to live in tend to have more serendipity and more mixed use, right? So again, you're having all these different sort of services, both commercial and residential, mixed up together because it's a much more human way of living. And that's the sort of theory behind it, but also in very practical ways, that sort of very synthetic grid layout that was a sort of symptom of the efficiency and growth at all costs mindset of the industrial era is shifting to actually looking at the wisdom and the virtue of even older and ancient civilizations and how they built their cities that at first glance looks hugely chaotic. If you've ever been privileged to travel to a place like Morocco or Marrakesh, you'll see that you can't walk in a straight line. The cities are anything but parallel. It's very difficult to find your way around there. We're very lucky that we now have things like Google Maps and satellites that we can navigate even those chaotic cities. But if you actually look into the science behind it, cities like Marrakesh have actually been built in a sort of spiral shape, which actually forms natural air conditioning for the entire city at a city scale, something you would never get in a grid type city, which enhances negative weather effects rather than mitigates them. And this, of course, ties in very neatly with the rise of things like sponge cities. And sponge cities are being developed to try and literally sort of soak up things from flash floods that are very concrete, again, very grid layouts are very bad at doing. They're not very good at adapting and building contingency into more chaotic weather and climate as we go forward. This idea of having more livable, more natural city layouts is good for people. And it's good for the planet. So it's one of those rare win-win conversations that we're having, which we think are, are very, very interesting. And of course, we can think of those sponge cities as being more than just sort of soaking up weather, but also different ways to deal with different sorts of extreme climates as more and more of us has, have to contend with that. So how does this livable city concept that you've just spoken about apply to townships and informal settlements? Now, you raise an interesting point when it comes to these livable cities and what happens with townships and informal settlements, of which, of course, we have many in South Africa. I think the key learning there is that as we try and improve living conditions for people living in those places is to follow what has already been built, just like you've all seen those those sort of graphics of what happens when architects design a beautiful footpath in concrete around a building. And then you see how people walk across the grass, right? And they make a new path, which doesn't look very nice, but it's much more efficient, you know? We've got to follow what people have currently built, the sort of city layouts that have organically emerged. We should be enhancing that and we should be adding greater services to those sorts of layouts rather than trying to wipe them out and replace them with sort of concrete towers. Now, there have been terrible disasters, terrible fires that have taken place in some of those low-cost developments in other parts of the world. But it's not just that. Again, I come back to the ideas of Jane Jacobs of how when, again, New York City and many of the American cities tried to gentrify what they termed them to be slums, is they tore down these very eclectic, very livable, very sort of emergent buildings and replaced them with planned settlements, which end up being very sort of Soviet-looking, very industrial, very brutalist concrete blocks, which are not good for safety and they're not good for community development and they actually end up sort of enhancing things like poverty and sort of just systemic oppression, which is kind of the opposite of what we want. So as we do to try and improve the living standards of people living in informal places, what you really want to do is help them to live their best lives within their communities, but with better quality building, with better access to services, and with better access to things like, of course, uh, safety and security too. So services, not just in terms of water and electricity, but also in terms of things like access to policing and education. So we want a bit of everything. Again, we don't want to replace and homogenize those communities. We really want to embrace that sort of eclecticness that is there already and rather just enhance the degree of, of access to, to all things that we want to flourish as human beings. Bronwyn, what key trends do you see around the future of technology and cities? I think when it comes to the, the future of technology and cities, one of the trends that we have been looking at is how cities are setting up service providing portals and even full governments and embassies 
in the metaverse, right? This is where you're able to get some of the service delivery that you currently have to go on down to home affairs to. You can now do it in a metaverse environment. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to don a virtual reality headset. It could just mean that you're engaging with the chatbots or engaging with some sort of form of AI instead of having to actually deal with the human being. And that for us is quite a good trend. I mean, it's happened on quite a large scale. There's some governments that have set up embassies, even declared sovereign land in metaverse platforms. Other governments, have, of course, have just embraced things like chatbots or virtual persons and virtual citizens. I think in Tokyo was one of the first cities that did that, where citizens can essentially engage with this virtual persona to get their problems solved. That's a good way to think about how technology and AI is going to be integrated into our lives in a positive way. Any technology that cuts down on time and fat and cost is generally a good thing. We want to embrace. We don't want to resist it. If, we, if it saves us a trip from sitting in a hard, broken plastic chair at home affairs for three hours, I am absolutely all for that. And that's the sort of thing that frees up human beings to work smarter and more efficiently. And that's what technology usually does. That's not to say that they're not people that end up getting caught up within the change, that end up having to reskill at a faster rate than other people. And these things can feel quite unfair and they can perpetuate inequalities in our society. We have to be quite realistic about that. I think that overall, what the technologies that are all buzzwords at the moment, your GPTs, your metaverses, all these sorts of things can do, is they can increase our connectivity, get us closer to other people if we use them well, and they can free up our time from inhuman tasks to do more human things. And I think that that in general is quite a positive shift. Is there one thing that you believe will happen this year that many people will not particularly agree with you on? And I think that, that one of the things that we're going to see, whether people like it or not, it's not necessarily that they will disagree, they might just disagree, they don't want it to happen, is that we're definitely seeing businesses forcing their staff back into the office place. I think that's important to note again for cities. So a lot of those congestion issues are going to come back. We're seeing this, that's quite a lot of even South African offices might be comfortable to have their workforce working remotely, but international offices are now insisting that workers go back to work according to global standards. So if you are working for a company that has a multinational footprint, some of those trends might be shifting for better or for worse. Companies are still trying to figure out what this new change means, but I do think we are going to see a few of those sort of mandates to be both in, uh, at the same time and space as, well, as your colleagues coming back, whether, whether we like it or not. And then, of course, it's up to the workforce to see what they, what they do about that in, in exchange. Ronwen, in closing, Africa's got the youngest population in the world and is very literally the future. Flux Trains is launching a first-of-its-kind innovation tour in 2023. It's called The Future Starts Here in Africa. Tell us a bit more about it. Yeah, so the Future Starts Here in Africa is an event or tour that we're putting on with Flux Trends, where we are inviting corporate leaders, interested entrepreneurs, and in fact, people from all around the world that are interested in solution-based innovation. So actually come with us into a tour into Johannesburg, where there are entrepreneurs from in tiny one-man shops all the way through to really big corporations where young people are involved with, as I said, solution-based innovation. In other words, solving real problems. And the problems that we are looking for these entrepreneurs to solve are not the problem of how to extract as much money from corporate VC into the pocket of the entrepreneur in question. Rather, we're looking for people that are solving actual problems. And those actual problems tend to center around things like access to services, access to power and electricity, access to water, and access to food, shelter, and clothing. We're looking for people that are actually solving things in new ways. So they're all going to be young entrepreneurs, but our tours also include full multi-sensory experiences. So you will be part of the city to see, touch, touch, taste the future. And it's an exciting time to be in Africa. I'm sure you know that in April this year, we have a massive tipping point in world demography in that China will no longer be the world's most populous country. India will. But what not necessarily everybody is fully aware of is that next tipping point is going to take place here in Africa as Africa will become the most populous, youthful, and energetic continent in the world within the next sort of 20 to 30 years, which, is, which, is, which means we really are at the forefront in a very literal sense of the future. So we invite you to come and join us and actually meet that future on the ground. And that's going to be taking place on the 15th of June in Johannesburg. If you're interested, head on over to the fluxtrends.com website and we'll give you all the information there. A special thanks to Bronwyn Williams for this insightful conversation on key trends to look out for in 2023 here on Future Cities Africa. 